Hi everyone, welcome to my learning module. I want to tell you today about um, this poet, Gloria Odin, and I'm going to make the argument that I think one of the schools she might be associated with the most is the New York School of Poets, which, you know, may not actually be the strongest argument, but it is a argument, and um, I should say also that I'm somewhat biased because I've studied the New York school um, more than other schools, so she certainly belongs to many schools or perhaps even sort of defies categorization, um, but I think that she is definitely a poet that um, needs more attention. So I want to introduce to you um, a way of engaging with this lesson or other lessons and I hope that maybe you can even use it um, with your own students perhaps if you have students or in your own learning um, and that's this method of the X page so this is um, an activity that was designed by one of my heroes Linda Berry she is a teacher and also a comic strip creator. And the X page is a way of sort of trying to access different levels or different areas of consciousness. This one focusing on the consciousness associated with things that we do with our hands and creativity and more artistic things. So the X page is pretty simple. You just make an X across a page and that divides the page into four quadrants. The quadrants aren't meant to be solid lines. That's why I've sort of made them dotted here. And really you can put whatever you want on this, this page. Um, but she suggests, and some of these categories I've sort of made up on my own, um, is that in one, Quadrant, you put images, another one, questions, another one, quotations, and then I like to have this other one that's just other. <laughs> this is very roughly based on her idea. Um, but yeah, I think it's a great learning tool and I use it in my classrooms all the time. And I'd like us first to start off just by listening to a Gloria Odin poem. It was actually kind of hard to find a recording of her. Um, there's no videos of her, um, but there is this recording from 1979 uh, when she read at, I want to say, yeah, the Library of Congress. And as we're listening, we can be jotting down questions or quotations or especially images. Oh, great. <laughs> I am going to try and do this in one take, so I apologize for the interruption. Um, sorry about that interruption, everyone. I am going to try and not edit this video very heavily because I don't want to give you all the impression that you should have a really polished um, presentation. I mean, if you want to make it really polished, you can, but that's not really what we're looking for here. Um, it's more of a learning experience, I think, um, that invites engagement um, and invites questions and curiosity. I don't remember where I was. I think I was talking about how I want us to um, listen to this poem um, and jot down, oh, I know where I was going, jot down questions, quotations, absolutely, but maybe especially images because one of the angles that I want to talk about um, when we get to one of 
Gloria Odin's poems is the concentration of images. So here's her reading one of her poems. that she always sat in front of and to comb her hair. Okay, here it begins. The last poem I'm going to read of these, uh, on, uh, these poems that were published singly, this one is called The Riven Quarry. In my dry cell of love's heat, here in May, in lover's weather, I hunch over these words, shaping them to the image of my hunger, clothing them in the many-colored robes woven upon the loom of your absence. Scarlet and summer yellow, with jungle excess, vivid appetites of love hob the green grounds of my desire, and I observe myself the riven quarry of lust, the red demon. I would not have it, other. Let me not run to beauty on timid feet, but in whatever era my journeying may prove to be, arrive forwardly as sea exposing itself to the high-ribbed attractions of shore. Love that cannot shoulder its own torment forfeits the name. Or so I voice to myself, voyaging the Saharas between our contact, wolves sharp-eyed at the heels of spirit. The remainder of poems that I want to read Okay, um, I wanted us to hear that poem in her own voice. I think an important part of the work that we're doing too is not taking up too much space and letting these poets have their own voice. Um, so whenever I'm reading a poem in my class, I try to have it a recording of the poet themselves reading it. That's not always possible. Um, but yeah, I, I like to hear, um, the poets in their own voice. Sadly, the poem that I want to talk about today was not one of the ones that she read at the Library of Congress. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about this, um, the New York School. So, I love Frank O'Hara. He's one of my favorite poets, um... I find him an inspiration, and I've written quite a few things um, about him as well. And I took a class with one of the the probably most well-known um, Frank O'Hara slash New York School scholars, Dr. Andrew Epstein. Um, and one of the things that we studied, actually, <clears throat> was the fact that Amiri Baraka was sort of part of um, the New York School. He knew all these poets, like, quite intimately. As a matter of fact, there's sort of like jokes and sort of flippant comments about um, the relationship between Frank O'Hara and Amiri Baraka, who also was then going by Leroy Jones. Um, and Amiri Baraka obviously is um, a major, major, probably, I guess, the founder of the black arts movement. And so Amiri Baraka definitely is squarely kind of in the middle of there or of the New York school and the black arts poets. Um, or maybe he even like sort of turned away from New York school and um, maybe some of the black arts movement even as sort of a reaction against um, the work he did earlier when he was associated with um, the New York School of Poets. So I think there's, 
it's exciting that my professor was including Amiri Baraka in the New York School of Poets. He also um, included some other poets that maybe aren't traditionally associated with them because the New York School of Poets are all white men, basically. Um, so I think that that's, it was interesting and I'm also interested in that. Um, but I think also stuff has already been said about um, Amiri Baraka. So I wanted to pick someone maybe less known um, who also was not a white man. So I'll just be honest, I went to this um, anthology that I have. It's relatively new. Is that true, Matt? Um, yeah, it was published in 2020. Um, I just went to this anthology and found some people that were um, living around the same time as the New York poets. Um, I was interested in seeing other voices that might fit in. And Gloria Odin and Frank O'Hara were born in the same year, which I've already forgotten, 1923. True or false? It's not going to tell me here. Um, and I think Wikipedia actually has some interesting things to say about the influences of Gloria Odin. And I hate it when teachers just read off of stuff, but I am just going to read off of this. Uh, briefly here. Uh, this is from Wikipedia. You can see the citations are from different scholarly, perhaps also um, less scholarly sources. It says, Gloria Odin studied poetry with Kimon Fryer, Louise Bogan, and Leonie Adams, and later associated with Arna Bontemps, Robert Hayden, Marianne Moore, Elizabeth Bishop, and Mark Van Doren. She was friends with Langston Hughes and Sam Allen, read with Amiri Baraka and Sonia Sanchez, and worked in the same law firm, firm as Polly Murray. As Odin herself describes, I am sure, but if you realize how today young poets know each other, have opportunities to publish each other, move themselves forward in the literary world, you see how much of a hit and miss it was for me. Had I not, had I never met any of the persons I mentioned, I would not exist as a poet. Um, so she does have an interesting story where she was studying at law school or studying law at um, Howard and they didn't have a creative writing um, program. So she kind of got to know these other poets um, that helped her. It goes on to say, as critic C.K. Doreski argues, a key influence on Odin's poetry, especially her earlier work, was Elizabeth Bishop. Odin recalls coming across one of Bishop's collections in 1955 or 56 and writing to her. The two began a correspondence that Bishop later recommended Odin for her Yaddo res residency. Odin didn't come across many black poets until Breadloaf several years later. So these types of interracial mentorships, especially with white women, were formative for Odin. Marianne Moore was another source of early encouragement. According to Odin, the first thing she did was to feed me a sandwich of cream cheese and have me drink a glass of milk because I looked a bit thin to her. Then she took my piece by piece, took me piece by piece through everything I handed in and critiqued. She had read it all beforehand, and when I gave, and when I left, she gave me several legal sized yellow lined pages of her criticisms, bearing at the top, full of merit, threatened by trifles, joy. It was also Moore who got Odin to stop signing her poems G.C. Odin, which she initially did because of prejudice against female poets. So, I think a, one move might be to sort of tie um, Odin with Elizabeth Bishop. And Elizabeth Bishop is also perhaps a little bit difficult to categorize too, although, you know, she's sort of a modernist poet, sort of a confessional poet, maybe. I think she gets lumped in more quickly with the confessional poets because she's a woman, but... Um, there's even sort of ties with her in like the metaphysics poets who were way, way, way earlier than Elizabeth Bishop. Um, so I think that that, you know, that argument is a great argument as well. Um, 
especially because both Odin and Bishop have this sort of like they sort of are talking about writing the the speaker of their poem often seems like a friend afar someone far away um but I think that might be just like too simple because they knew each other uh the Wikipedia article goes on to say, as Odin's years of correspondence with Langston Hughes demonstrate, he also served as an important mentor to her. However, her relationship to, quote, black poetry was somewhat complicated. She often felt she did not belong or that her writing was neglected because her poetry, quote, was not pointedly black in context, style, or language. Nevertheless, as critic Doreski points out, Odin's concern with poetry, not just as a vehicle for protest, but as an art form meaningful to all, places her well within the formalist tradition of County Cullen and Elizabeth Bishop. Uh, so here, they're kind of calling them these formalists. Her various communities clearly thought of her this way. For example, she was among the group of black poets, artists, critics, and scholars who gathered at the University of Dayton during the weekend of October 20th, 1972, to celebrate the centennial of the birth of Paul Lawrence Dunbar, reading alongside Alvin Auber, Nikki Giovanni, Marker S. Harper, Etheridge Knight, Sonia Sanchez, Raymond Patterson, Lorenzo Thomas, John Oliver Killen, Polly Mitchell, Marshall, J. Sa Saunders Redding, and the very young Alice Walker. Her view, expressed in the unpublished essay Negritude, So What, sent to Langston Hughes in a 1965 letter, that the Negro in the United States is not African, he is American, nevertheless, was important to how she saw her poetry. As she expresses below, Oda can never, could never forget that she was black, but because she was black, she saw her responsibility to reach all Americans as even greater. Both artist and Negro is no easy thing in the United States. Usually the Negro straddles two words, worlds. First, obviously, the Negro world into which he is born. It's so interesting that she's using these masculine pronouns too more than likely the second world the one in which he works will be white there is a very important third world however an integrated world made up of white and non-white participants in a racial dialogue burdensome or not fair or not i believe it is a particular responsibility of the negro artists to make the most of this third world, not by wringing from their white opposites admissions of inherited guilt, inferiority, or whatever admissions years of anger and anguish have bred in them, but by working with them to give major dimension and substance to an image of America, which encompasses the contributions of all the various racial and religious groups that are joined on this continent. <clears throat> So it sort of reminds me of this argument or this dialogue between Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois um, <clears throat> of what is sort of the place of um, the black artist. And so I think it's maybe kind of why I'm not sure that Odin belongs squarely with the black arts movement, although there are many ways of protesting and many, many ways of being any kind of identity, including being black. Um, I guess when we go off of this expressive language by Amiri Baraka as sort of a manifesto for the black arts movement, I think this is where I really, I don't see her quite fitting in. Um, Baraka writes, I heard an old Negro street singer last week, Reverend Pearly Brown, singing God Don't Never Change. This is a precise thing he is singing. He does not mean God does not ever change. He means God don't never change. The difference, and I said it was crucial, is in the final human reference, the form of passage through the world. A man who is rich and famous who sings God don't never change is confirming his hegemony and good for fortune, or merely calling the bank. A blind, hopeless blank. A blind, hopeless black American is saying something very different. He's telling you about the extraordinary order of the world, but he's not telling you about his fate. Fate is a luxury available only to those fortunate citizens with alternatives. The view from the top of the hill is not the same 
as that from the bottom of the hill, nor are most viewers at either end of the hill even certain that, in fact, there is any other place from which to look. Looking down usually eliminates the possibility of understanding what is what it must be like to look up, or try to imagine yourself as not existing. It is difficult, but po poets and politicians try every other day. Being told to speak proper, meaning that you become fluent with the jargon of power, is also part of not speaking proper. That is, the culture which desperately understands that it does not speak proper or is not fluent with the terms of social strength also understands somewhere its desire to gain such fluency is done at a terrifying risk. Um, and so this obviously in education was like a big um, discussion and I think also why maybe I'm not placing um, Odin in the Black Arts Movement. This was written by Dr. G, um, I believe back in, I think this was 79, hmm. not sure when this article was written, I'll have to put it in the notes. Um, and this was one of her earlier pieces. Um, and she writes, um, she shows this example, teacher's assignment. Take a position on the war in Vietnam and present arguments to defend your position. And then she gives the student example. I think the war in Vietnam bad because we don't have no business over there. My brother's friend been in the war and he say it's hard and mean. I do not like war because it's bad. And so I don't think we have no business there. The reason the war in China is bad is that American boys is dying over there. And she writes, the paper was returned to the student with only one comment, correct your grammar and resubmit. What sheer and utter nonsense. Now my advice to teachers is to overlook these matters of sheer mechanical, quote, correctness and get on with the educational business at hand. Don't let students get away with sloppy, irresponsible writing just because it happens to conform to a surface notion of correctness. Yeah, that's right. There's such a thing as sloppy, correct writing. Writing, for instance, where every statement is a generalized comment without any specific supporting details, or where the same modification modification structures or sentence patterns are used with tedious repetition, or where the student uses one simple kernel structure after another instead of combining and condensing. While zeros and, e and ED morphemes must may be easier issues for the already overworked English professors to deal with, I would warn such teachers not to abdicate their real responsibility. And I think this is kind of why I'm sharing this with, with you all, as many of you are. Um, teachers, um, it's, she says, that of involving students in the totality and complexity of the communication process, and I would denounce as futile and time-wasting the attempts to move black students from, for example, he tired to he is tired, or from they sold their house to they sold their house. Not only are such ventures misuses of important educational time, they are perhaps, albeit subtly racist, because such goals involve only lateral moves, and black folks need upward vertical moves. That is what we mean when we sing with Curtis Mayfield. We move in on up, up, not sideways. So, you know, I think Odin sort of tried to perhaps not be as, um, like, outwardly and openly um, political. But that doesn't mean that she was not political. And that's um, why I do think she actually kind of belongs in the New York School of Poets. So, you know, the New York School doesn't seem like a great fit here. Like, they were known for their sort of painterly approach, and they um, incorporated a lot of the arts. And um, they all most of them actually like literally knew each other unlike other schools they all were living together like in New York but and they are often seen as apolitical like they don't they're not known as being political um poets but I think they were quite political actually um but just more subtly so like Frank O'Hara um one of the more perhaps outspoken 
poets, um, wrote a lot about his queer identity. And um, I think that that's like very political, even if it is sort of understated, so to speak, in his work. Um, even Michael Schmidt, who, you know, as you read this book, will come to appreciate, but also perhaps not appreciate at the same time. Even he, at the end of the, our chapter that we're reading this week, he says, um, the hunger for justice does not die down. It grows more intense with the passage of years. About this New York school poet, um, Wainwright, I believe. Um, but I think this is true of the New York school poets, is that they do have this hunger for justice. And perhaps as they get older, or Frank O'Hara never really had the opportunity to get older because he died um, relatively young. Um, I think that that politics perhaps comes out more. I think another thing that makes me sort of group Odin in with the New York School um, is this poem we have, one of the poems that she wrote, um, it's called Review from Staten Island, which like right away made me think of this um, Frank O'Hara poem that he says he wrote on, on the way from Staten Island, on the Staten Island Ferry. Um, and it's actually just called Poem, but it's, it's one of his more famous poems. Um, and it goes like this. It says, Lana Turner has collapsed. I was trotting along and suddenly it started raining and snowing and you said it was hailing, but hailing hits you on the head hard. So it was really snowing and raining and I was in such a hurry to meet you, but the traffic was acting exactly like the sky. And suddenly I see a headline, Lana Turner has collapsed. There's no snow in Hollywood. There's no rain in California. I have been to lots of parties and acted perfectly disgraceful, but I never actually collapsed. Oh, Lana Turner, we love you. Get up. And then here is Odin's poem that is the one that I want to look at today. It's called Review from Staten Island. The skyline of New York does not excite me, faring towards it, as mountains do in snow-steeped hostility to sun. There is something in the view, spewed up from water, to pure abandonment in air, that snakes my spine with cold and mouse tracks over my heart. Strewn across the meat of wave and wind, it seems the incompleted play of some helter-skeltering child, whose hegira, as all our circles go, has not yet led him back, but will ripe with that ferocious glee which can boot these building blocks to earth, then heal under. One gets used to dying, living. Growth is an end to many things. Even the rose disposes of summer, but still wince at being there when the relentless foot kicks down and the tides come roaring over to pool within the unlearned depths of me. So I think you can see a lot of similarities there, actually, um, between uh, the New York School, especially that one Frank O'Hara poem that I just read in this poem. And for me, this is kind of most clearly seen in image. I want to talk a little bit about the angle of rhetoric too, but um, Hirschfeld writes in her section on imagery, images concentration like sounds is a field where the energies of mind and body meet. And I think we could see that both in the Frank O'Hara poem and this poem. Our thoughts and um, bodily sensations or experiences um, within the same poem. Uh, and then, of course, the question that I love to ask when it, when it's concerning, um, image is Hirschfeld's question, 
uh, how does this interconnection of animate and inanimate exterior and interior work? So right away we start, it's, it's almost like we're starting with the interior in this poem because she says, the skyline of your New York does not excite me. We're already like inside of her thoughts here. The poem actually does start though with the skyline of New York, which like, I don't know about you, but for me, that's like absolutely a painting or at least a photograph, right? Um, the New York school being known for sort of this like painterly style here. She is actually starting with um, an image, although it's directly sort of subverted or subjugated under um, her feelings here um, or her mind. But also I feel like excitement, you know, is typically one of the more, I suppose, bodily um, emotions. Like we feel excitement, um, you know, like tingling and we're sort of nervous perhaps, or um, I think it is also linked here to the body. Um, and then ferrying towards it, I think another thing that the New York School poets are sort of famous for is that they're constantly writing about moving through the city. Oh, by the way, while I'm here, Gloria Odin was born and lived in New York. Um, she went to high school in New Rochelle, and um, so she is in many ways a New Yorker as well. Um, But she says that she is um, excited by mountains, um, especially as, as she says, as mountains do in snow steeped hostility to sun. And she's got this like, she's setting up this sort of um, conflict here. She even says like hostility um, between the city, which perhaps is dark and these snow steeped um, mountains there. And then she writes, there's something in the view, again, like very painterly to me, spewed up from water to pure abandonment in air. And here's where I think she's doing like a lot of the stuff that um, Hirschfeld points out concerning imagery. She says that snakes my spine with cold. So here we not only have like internal, the internal imagery of like, you know, I guess sort of maybe a feeling of abandonment or coldness um, and then the outwardly sort of nature sign here of snakes but also so bodily it's like attached to the spine um, and same thing here with mouse mouse tracks over my heart like a physical part of the body um, but then also this sort of nature imagery here uh, then she writes, strewn across the meat of wave and wind, it seems the incompleted play of some helter skeltering child uh, whose Hegira, as all our circles go, has not yet led him back, but will ripe with that ferocious glee which can boot these building blocks to earth, then heal under. So um, this sort of circle here that she's creating, this like difficult journey. Um, you know, for me, definitely a, this circular, um, movement or image comes to mind, which sort of is, you know, juxtaposed against, this isn't so much a circle, this is sort of a contrast. And here she's sort of putting it all into, um, a cycle, and then that will continue throughout the poem. She writes, one gets used to dying, living, growth is an end to many things, even the rose disposes of summer, but still uh, wins at being there when the relentless foot kicks down and the tides come roaring over to pool within. So it is that sort of like cycle there. Um, and then she brings it back to the unlearned depths of me, which is incredibly interior um, to me and something also that the New York school poets sort of weren't afraid to do is include themselves and the things that were um, important to them. Somewhat similar to the confessionalists, I suppose. Um, 
So yeah, I think image-wise, she can actually match up quite well with the New York School Poets. Again, she even has like New York School imagery, which of course um, the New York School Poets did. And then I think also there might be some similarities um, in rhetoric too. So one of the questions that, you know, Hirschfeld um, asks us about concerning rhetoric is um, who's talking to who and and why am I being told these things? Um, where does she actually say who's speaking to who? Oh, Matt, you should do your homework better. <laughs> um, and I think that's sort of difficult to see here. Um, maybe a little bit in this poem, like who is speaking and to whom are they speaking? Um, in this poem before A Private Letter to Brazil, uh, she writes, the map shows me where it is you are. I am here. So this is like clearly... Um, you know, a private letter. It's a letter between two people who are separated um, on different points of the map. By the way, if you're into maps, she loved maps. This is another um, excerpt of a poem about a map that she wrote. Um, so here, though, I think it's less clear who the speaker is it says review from staten island and all i can think about is like someone who writes a review like a book review or an art review and sort of reading this as like an expert talking about um the view from the staten from staten island um i think sort of makes it almost less personal or that the personal is important to the argument itself um I think, uh, you know, this is sort of like almost something like a food critic would say, like, oh, this food did not excite me, um, which she sort of undermines by going through all of this, like uh, the waves and everything that in a way it actually does sort of make her feel other things, perhaps not excited, but other things as well. Um, so when this is read as sort of almost like an art review or a food review, uh, I think it, that definitely matches up with um, the New York School, who, you know, many of them were art critics and wrote about art, John Ashbery and others too. Um, but I love that it ends with the unlearned depths of me, where it sort of like turns back um, towards this personal, but almost like that the personal is art, which of course is poetry, right? Like. art without emotion or without person, I'm not sure moves us. Perhaps it does. Perhaps it moves others. Maybe people are totally moved by um, landscapes, though they've never seen those landscapes themselves or um, completely detached from um, humanity or artists. So I'm, I think I'm heading close to um, a full lecture here of 50 minutes, which I did not mean to do. Um, but I hope you got some insight into Gloria Odin. I think that she, again, is a poet. Um, there's lots to write about. I did not find much, um, written about her. I think that she is definitely a poet worth archiving. Um, and here I am, you know, tying her closely to the New York school, but she certainly has ties to the black arts movement um and like we talked about before with elizabeth bishop um the modernists or confessionalists even um i'm gonna put some resources uh with this video so check those out those are my other way of creating student interaction um, thanks for watching till the end, everyone. Remember that I don't see this lesson necessarily as like an example or a model. I'm so excited to see what you all come up with. Um, feel free to do whatever you want. Um, and again, you are not graded on its like polish or glamour or um, any of that. Um, we want to have a conversation about these poets and that 
that's our overall point. Um, so how you do that is totally up to you. Thanks again for watching, and I will see you online.